Hey guys, my name is Eric, and today we're going to be doing an episode about radios with NC Scout. Go ahead and roll the intro. Hey guys, thanks for checking out another HatchetCast episode. And today we have a very special episode. We're gonna be doing a video on SIGINT and radio communications and how important that is. And we're gonna be discussing that with expert SNC Scout. So before we get started, make sure you hit the like and the subscribe button. It really does help out the channel. A really free, amazing way to help the channel out though is if you get something out of these videos, one, go check out NC Scout and his website and pick up some radio equipment or maybe even sign up for a course get a book and also share this video with a friend. So if you get something out of it, sharing that with a friend really helps out. Also go ahead and continue on the conversation in the comment section. There's a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge out there and are willing to help you out if you're kind of lost. There's a couple of trolls in there from time to time, but there's also a lot of really good people who really do care about helping further the community. So without further ado, welcome. What's up brother? Actually, I'm, thank I'm thankful <laughs> to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, really, really, gorgeous country up here and uh it's been nice yeah yeah welcome to the g-cam yeah the, the gorilla camp. <laughs> so you are the author of a book called the gorilla's guide to the Baofeng radio and this is available on amazon and also on your website yep. right brushbeater.store okay yeah that's uh there's there's a lot of knockoffs out there um you know when you i guess imitations best form of flattery yeah so yeah, to yeah. Speak, but like uh, there's a mountain of, of knockoff books and whatever, like that's, that's the original yeah. camo cover. Very simple. You know, it's, it's nothing flashy. The content of the book is, is what's important in there. And it's just a simple operating manual. Uh, the first chapter, really the first two chapters deal with the bow thing. Mm. Uh, everything else is operating techniques. Okay. So. You know, you've got an antenna theory chapter on improvised wire antennas for VHF and UHF, uh, breaking down the mathematics and the science behind it, kind of removing all of that to just what you need to know, you know, in a very simple end user, you know, like in the military, what we call a dash 10, no. like just operator manual. I don't necessarily need to know how to be an expert on any of this stuff. Mm. But what can I use to, to spin up very rapidly? Um, from there, you know, we get into digital operations, ComSec, uh, which is communication security, uh, how to encrypt traffic digitally, because believe it or not, believe it or not, you know, our little $25 Balfang radio here that <clears throat> people are either, they, they either think this is like the greatest thing in the history of the world or, you know, you'll get those folks out there and they're like, oh, this is a piece of junk. Yeah. Like, look, folks, at the end of the day, like $25 radio or, you know, however much they cost, some of them are a little upmarket. Understand something that, you know, you're going to hear some stuff like the ham radio community will say things, the prepper community will say stuff, like, you know, the tactical community, like whatever. All these subsets of groups out there. Um, at the end of the day, you know, 25 bucks yeah you're you're getting an analog radio that what you see is what you get yeah you know analog versus digital we'll, we'll get into that but one analog radio is essentially performing in the same role as any of the others right like functionally right it's the same it's like saying you know hey we all have our favorite ar-15 brand mm. right but like at the end of the day one ar-15 is functionally going to be the same as the other like the, there there may be differences in performance here and like little ways but one 556 five, weapon is the same as another 556 five, weapon right like the end of the day it's the same radio so 
you know, a lot of people want a point of entry into communications, as you should, uh, because shoot, move, and communicate is, you know, the, the, the triad of effectiveness. Mm. Um, great point of entry. Am I saying this is the greatest thing in the world? No, absolutely not. Mm. Like, you, you have to, to understand that it's $25. But it's a minimal investment that can be a jumping off point to more sophisticated means. Right. And, uh, you know, some of the things we're going to talk about and demonstrate in this episode is, you know, really where that jumping off point is and how to best implement it into a tactical communications plan, a preparedness communications plan, or even clandestine communications, which are all covered in the book. So I, I think that's something that, like, you. I think what holds a lot of people back from radio communications is there's an intimidation factor of like trying to, it's way over my head. I don't know, you know, there's so much information. Where do I start? Um, you know, I have to get, a, I have to get this license to even be able to use radios. Yep. Um, and so I think there's this preconceived notion that it's really difficult to get into. And then there's not too many reference materials out there except for like your book and some others, but there's also the, you know, Sometime when I first started looking into this, I was like, and I heard the ham community is also kind of like, you know, they're gatekeepers almost. So that, yeah. that's that's also something that has kind of makes it intimidating. Just like someone who gets into the gun community for the first time, it's intimidating. Yeah. Um, but where do you recommend people just start off? And so, why is it important? Yeah, man. Um, I'll tell you, like, a little bit of a backstory. So when I got out of the Army. Yeah. Um, I kind of had that that separation, you know, that that you know, sociologists would call that enemy, right? right. Like that's that's a technical term for it, where you're you're just kind of cut off from the the larger body, and um, you know there was a lot of instability in the world back then, just like there is now. You know, you're talking about a decade ago, and and um, you know when I got out, I knew that the from being a trigger puller and coming from that world, that communications was very important. And, um, you know, some of the units that I was in, we had a pretty serious focus on communications. It was a critical role. And when you're working unsupported, you, you actually have to be better at that than, you know, your standard line infantry unit. Right. And um, with that said, you know, I understood the importance, but, you know, everybody's working on a budget. I was working on a very tight budget at that time. I mean, you know, I went from being a you know an nco to you know in the army to now all of a sudden um back in college yeah and everything is a tight budget on top of having a family and mm -hmm. everything else and you know working part-time and all the things so you know very limited budget not a lot of really good information and one thing that i, I started noticing as i was floating around in the um the prepper spaces, yeah. the survivalist spaces. It was this massive disconnect between the amateur radio community or ham radio, right, which is a, a nickname, and the 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 uh, practical application of things. And I want to be real specific about this. Like, I'm a ham. I'm an amateur extra. Um, have been for for a long time now, and. Um, you know, I've been, I've been a VE, I give the tests, all that stuff, but something that needs to be pointed out is that ham radio is a hobby. Yeah. It's a hobby. It's, it's, it's a hobby that has a lot of practical application to it, but at the end of the day, man, it's a hobby. Like, they, and, and that's the disconnect, is that, especially online, there's, there's like this... I hate to say it, but there's some parallels to the shooting community. There's mm. a strong overlap where there's a lot of toxicity. Man. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of gatekeeping and there's like brand loyalty and, you know, and you find that it with, with a lot of stuff. I think it's really unfortunate that guys will, you know, want to poo-poo on people. Like, oh, why are you using that brand or like whatever? And and um, that's that's not cool when when we need to be focusing on building one another up right. and building that aggregate knowledge up. So one thing that, that I learned was that, you know, first of all, again, 25 hour radio, you're not, you're not getting the greatest piece of equipment in the world. And anybody who thinks that you are, you know, just, you're just not. Yeah. But one thing that I came to realize is that, um, 
as I was kind of on that journey, like I started in the license free world. So there's, you know, there's some license free VHF, very high frequency uh, bands that, that this radio is capable of, of uh, operating in. And there's also license free UHF. And so real quick, you know, and I dive into this deep in the book, but real quick, I want to uh, talk about VHF versus UHF. So VHF, very high frequency. Um, 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz, like traditionally. And this radio will operate in uh, 136 megahertz mm. to 174 megahertz. And that's in the VHF band that this radio is capable of oh, operating wow. in. So the license-free segment of that is called MERS, or Multi-Use Radio Service. Uh, 151 or 151.82 megahertz, and it's it's uh, that's channel one. There's five channels in there. I've got them listed. So like the book acts as like a cheat sheet when you go to the field. Nice. Um, so, you know, that's why I've got the, the handy dandy spiral bound version <laughs> here. Um, but, uh, which is significantly smaller. You know, you could stow this in a, in, in a, uh, dump pouch or a little, you know, pocket or something like we used to call these tax ops. I know. Well, yeah. Know. I mean, we had, um, they were called like cheat manuals. So like yeah. Yeah. we had all these manuals, like, I can't remember all this equipment. So it was just like, right. just follow the steps in this pocketbook. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and this is actually the original way. There's been a lot of people that reached out to me like the, the, the mass market version yeah. right here. They're like, that book is is huge. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, it is. This is actually the original version of it. Mm. It was meant to be a, a pocket reference manual. And then we just, when we did the mass market version, it was significantly larger, um, which, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. But uh, this is the version I always carry with me, you know, and, and mine, I've got the, the non duct tape version so I can <laughs> kind of show it off. Yeah, mine is, is covered in duct tape and, you know, and weatherproofed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but um, MERS uh, VHF is really well suited for rural terrain. Okay. So like where we are right now in the, in the foothills, man, um, rural environments works really well for that. UHF in turn, uh, ultra high frequency is more suited to urban environments okay. and so uh in the rto course which is our, our uh, communications course that i teach um you know taught a lot of people right here in this room i always because I, I use little mnemonic devices you know mm -hmm. to help me memorize stuff and, and you know quick recollection in the field i'm sure you know you do that too yeah and i just remember that uhf u could be urban so that's how I remember that. Ah. So when I'm writing a, a signals operating instructions or an SOI, which is our communications plan, I can quickly re recall like, all right, my intended operating environment, these are the frequencies that are gonna work best for me. Yeah. So now I'm gonna uh, speak on UHF, which is some, some terms that, that people in the audience are probably very familiar with, and that is FRS and GMRS. So FRS, Family Radio Service, and general mobile radio service. So these two are like your, your bubble pack radios, your blister pack radios you get from Walmart. Oh, so like, like when my kids get the two walkie talkies. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So those are going to operate in the 462 megahertz range, which is solidly in the middle of UHF, right? These radios on UHF will operate from 400 to 470 and yeah. some of them operate up to 512 megahertz um so you you're right there in the middle of that that's a license free space when it's frs and then gmrs is the same channels but you can run up to 50 watts and uh -huh. there's a there's a small fee with a license there's no testing requirement or anything like that like it is with amateur radio and now all of a sudden you have you know, a, a radio system that you can use repeaters on. And um, in my book, I've got a, a uh, appendix in there on how to build repeaters using a Baofeng radio in a, you know, in a, a potentially UW environment. And there's some uh, use cases for that. GMRS and FRS, this is a very effective option for a lot of people. Yeah. That, that's going to work really well. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a good jumping off point for communications because when people come to this, most people are coming to the communications world from the survival perspective Yeah. of like, hey, I, I am living in like this area 
and my family is dispersed out, you know, out, out here, wherever. And I want a means to communicate with them if the grid all of a sudden goes down. Or yeah. Like, you know, EMP happens or like we, we're, you know, we've got CMEs that are coming from, from the sun because the, our solar cycle is becoming more active now. And there's, you know, all this fear, like the, the grid could be damaged in, in a number of ways. And there are severe vulnerabilities there. So FRS and GMRS presents to us a pretty effective tool. And again, I cover that in depth in the book. Um, but, you know, here it is. I mean, and for 25 bucks, you have interoperability across the board. You can stand up communications with people over, a, you know, a, a relatively local area very effectively and very quickly. Mm. And, and the book covers that in a step-by-step -step process on how to do it. Yeah, I think the one thing that as far as, you know, personally for me, as far as radio application, the reason why the Beofeng and these other, you know, analog radios kind of are appealing to me is because I feel like if the grid does go down, mm -hmm. every person with a walkie-talkie is going to be trying to get on that net. So you're going to have a lot of traffic. You're not going to have a lot of ability to be able to, hey, is that, you know, is that my family member that's talking to me? Or is that some other person that's interjecting on my comms or talking over me? And then right. as far as like a a Minuteman standpoint in terms of being a prepared citizen, it just seems like a very vulnerable, you know, type of system to be on. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, we, we've kind of talked about, you know, analog radio and totes and, and at how it specifically applies to most people's point of entry. You know, you have a, a analog radio. So analog versus digital um, analog radio. So what basically what you see is what you get. Anything that, you know, I'm keying up the mic and I'm talking and, you know, all right, cool. Whatever I'm putting in there is what's going out over the airwaves. Right. That's analog in a nutshell. Digital waveforms. So, like, uh, for example, you know, we've got some DMRs here. Um, these are, are some that I carry in the store. Um, you're talking about significant more expensive but you know digital mobile radio dmr um you know dmr is its own proprietary mode we can talk about that more if you want to but these are actually taking your speech and turning it into a digital waveform mm. and transmitting that over the air so you can encrypt that um these offer aes 256 which is very strong levels of encryption uh, built into the device and you know in, into the protocol itself and so there's a lot of advantages there um, the nice thing about these this is the the Baofeng Tech uh, 6x2 which mm. is a DMR radio it's waterproof and you know it's IP rated and everything it's a really good piece of gear uh, but with that said you know it, it operates in the same frequency ranges and it has all the same capabilities, and, and there's some backwards capability between microphones and, and uh, what have you, the plugs and everything. But but the trade-off is you're talking about a $200 radio versus a $25 radio. Right. What's more likely that people are going to have? Yeah. What are they actually going to have on them? And, you know, I'm sure that we've probably all run into this. When I was first getting into communications, and I've got my, you know, my local group of friends, my mutual assistance group, like, yeah. our, you know, a lot of us out there have that training friends, and um, guys that, that we have range time with, you know, what are they more likely to buy? Because mm -hmm. again, going back to what I was saying, we're all on tight budgets, yeah. one way or another, and and even if you're not on a tight budget, it becomes a question of. What can you justify? Yeah. You know, what can you justify? Um, not everybody can justify a $200 radio when you don't even have the basics mastered. Mm. You know, yeah. and it's kind of like rifles. You know, everything going back to, to tying into the gun community. Um, why is somebody who's never picked up an AR-15 before going to spend $1,800 on like a Sons of Liberty Gunworks rifle? Right. You should because they're awesome yeah. and they're incredibly well built and the, the owner of the company is awesome, dude. Yeah. But, you know, you, a guy that's never touched a weapon before probably is going to be better off with something lower end mm. or down market and run the, the snot out of it and learn what you actually need and yeah. what you don't. Yeah. 
and and it's it's the same with Kamo, man. Mm. And that way they gain that confidence, and they begin to learn like, okay, cool, this, this is what I actually need. And then when they make the jump into the amateur radio world, so amateur radio, uh, where does ham radio fall into this? So we were talking about license free stuff, and the community networking aspect. Where does amateur radio jump into the the equation? Um. For me, I became a ham because I learned with the license-free communications, that's really only going to take you so far. Mm. You you need to have a community. And the ham radio community, by and large, is, is kind of a mixed bag, just like the shooting community. There, there's some excellent people in it. And then there's the guys that are, you know, just like, eh, you could kind of take them or leave them. Right. And you find it a lot online. The shooting community is exactly the yeah, same. It's, I can you attest know, to that, yeah. forums and stuff. Hey, you know, like, you, I tell you, something that I read Hendrix said one time that, that I always, like, stuck with me and I thought was really, really cool is good attitude to have about it. Those guys are too busy running their traps online <laughs> they're not out shooting it's the same with radio man yeah. those those guys that are too busy they're online they're talking all trash oh you know if you don't own this you you don't know what you're doing or mm. whatever hey man you know like all right that's cool what are you out doing yeah and and i've run into this you know over the years you get those trolls like yeah we we all get them when you're in the public eye you're always going to get them and uh, I'll have those guys that, like, they'll say something about the book. They'll be like, oh, I'd never buy that book because it's about bow things. It's like, well, yeah. Yeah, the first chapter is. Yeah. Or, yeah, the first two chapters are. The rest of this operating manual. It's like, okay, well, you know, what are you doing to mm. better the community? Yeah. Because I've sold over 100,000 copies of that book. Yeah. And I like to think that that's gotten a lot of people on the air. Mm. And that's got them at least there. At a minimum, a jumping off point. Yeah. And those guys that are that are trying to throw shade at you, what have you done? You know? And, well, I mean, at the end of the day, it goes back to, like, you know, most of the barrel and ha I mean, I, I would say the barrel and hatchet community is really good. And the comments of just, like, yeah. really encouraging good conversation, passing on knowledge. And, and so you're right. Like, there's communities that have their trolls, but it's just, like, just let it be water off a duck's back. Like, oh, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, cool, you're not providing me the information I need. I'm yeah. going to go look somewhere else to find information. Yeah. So, yeah. I think the one thing is that you were talking about price point, um, something that's sometimes, I guess, would be frustrating if you're in a group is trying to convince other people who aren't interested at all in radios to be like, hey, man, just at least get a Bayo thing so that way you can have comms and we can talk. Mm -hmm. And then I will take the time, if you're interested, and have that one person who's interested in ham yeah. to kind of invest more time and knowledge and learning and, and getting better equipment to be Absolutely. able to use that for the group. Maybe make them an RTO. Absolutely. And you know, here's here's the thing, again, going back to ham radio, ham right. radio. Ham radio, by the way, uh, I know like Randy with Naruba Cons, buddy of mine, um, he is the master of trolls, yeah. by the way. Like he is the master counter troll. Oh, nice. Which is uh, it, it's some of his videos are hilarious because he 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 does it. He just really enjoys it. Mm. But um, you know it, that's not my flavor, but I do find it funny. Uh, but you know, amateur radio ham radio is actually a nickname. Um, back in the the early days of radio, uh, amateurs were it, it was like a rich man's hobby. Yeah. And everything was done with Morse code back then. Like we're talking early 1900s here, and you know, amateurs. You had your professional telegraph operators, and then you had guys that were just amateurs that were just, you know, hitting the key. You know, yeah. For for Morse code, and uh, they would call them ham-fisted operators, and that's where I nicknamed. Oh wow! Them. And it just stuck. Um, but amateur radio again, it, it's a hobby, but it's a really good one to get into because. There are some incredible, incredible amateur radio guys yeah. in the larger community that are out there. Um, I've been able to foster, you know, a, a segment of that community that's that's just awesome. And I get those guys in class, and you know, and, and hang out with them, and we get on the air, and you know, it, it's it is so so awesome. And there is so much more to it than what you see at face value online. Right. Um, but you know, like how that applies to radio. So case in point, you know, we were talking about analog versus digital, right? So kind of revisiting that and, and, you know, whether it's license free or whether it's GMRS or, 
um, you know, or, or, or ham, you know, um, the amateur radio thing, at least you have people to talk to. Yeah. You know, with license free stuff, it can be hit or miss. Okay. Whether you, whether you actually have people I've, uh, taught all over the United States. Um, one of the, the most incredible communities that I ever had was out West, mm -hmm. an undisclosed state out West. I don't want to give these guys away. But they have a, a gigantic community that they've built. And I was thinking that, you know, this this uh, group of preppers, basically, that I was going to go do a class for in this undisclosed Western state was going to be, you know, the usual for me. It was like 10, 15 people. That's what I was thinking. I had 15 people enrolled in the class. And I was thinking that was going to be about the limit of it. And then when uh, they asked me to speak at one of their meetings and... It was like 200 people. Wow. And the mayor of the town was one of them. Was one of them. <laughs> and this That's is awesome. This is a large, yeah. this is, this isn't a town. This is a city. Wow. In one of the states. And yeah, I'm not, some of you are going to get to see the video and y'all you, you, are going to be like, he's talking about us. And yes, I am. <laughs> but, um, they have a, a GMRS network that has a series of repeaters. And I was just like, really inspired by how involved they are yeah. and all that and yeah. it's so so cool so it, it really it's case by case thing and, and they've got in their valley and mm -hmm. where they live they have this entire network that is just set up that's completely off grid and it's so cool to see that so um kind of jumping back to the the digital versus analog and right. all of that right so dmr right so we got a dmr radio here you know more expensive more robust radio. It's a you know waterproof, all this cool stuff. Um, since I have digital waveform, you can encrypt that with your you know your, your software on a computer and everything. All right, cool. Yeah, really, really cool. However, however, um, once upon a time, there was this general who testified before Congress, and he was the the head of the intelligence community. Yeah. And he said that, you know, we kill people based on metadata, right? Hmm. So the general I'm talking about is Michael Hayden, and he testified before Congress and said, we kill people based on metadata. He was exactly right. Yeah. And in you know, many, many such cases, time sensitive targeting, targeting cell phones, um, you know, and, and eventually, you know, something that, that we always said overseas is that, you know, all, all the dumb ones are dead. Yeah. Which is a fact. And they're getting smarter and smarter. With with each insurgent that we kill, they're getting smarter about what they're doing. And eventually, uh, they didn't completely abandon phones, but their TTPs would evolve with their casualty rate. Mm. And um, what they eventually started doing when, you know, by the time ISIS rolled around, was they were utilizing DMR very heavily. Um, we began exploiting that, and you know the same is true in Ukraine through 2014 with the conflict in, in uh, the conflict in the Donbass, yeah. and then you know going into uh, Euromaidan and and all of that, like the, the fallout from that, and then the the subsequent invasion, the Russian invasion. Uh, DMR played a digital mobile radio played a which, which is a proprietary mode yeah. played a very heavy role in all of that yeah. because it offers such a strong level of communication security mm. built into a basically a plug and play device. Right. Well, that also has a trade off. It carries a lot of metadata with it, yeah. and we were utilizing that to high effect against ISIS. And that's one of the things like in the online communities, the shooter communities that, that are kind of embracing communications now, yeah. they recognize the value in it. There's a, uh, for a period of time, there's a heavy emphasis that's placed on DMR. And it's kind of warning people like, don't, don't necessarily get into the trap of this is what we're doing and this is all we're going to do. Put all your eggs in one basket. Exactly. Yeah. Because, you know, let's say like, the world has gone sideways and you know as we all know you've been overseas you've seen you know when the world goes sideways what a war zone looks yeah. like nothing like violence and chaos doesn't exist in a vacuum yeah right there they're always going to be there's always going to be a power structure that is trying to establish itself or re-establish control and when it does that 
you know, normally there's going to be conflicts between competing power structures, right? right? And that's where civil wars and, and, and sectarian violence and, and all that stuff exists. Well, you know, a lot of times with preppers, the survival community, and, you know, people are kind of seeing, um, you know, there's a lot of fear about how things deteriorate in the United States for a variety of, of vectors. You know, you have economic chaos, you have uh, natural disasters, natural yeah. disasters, things like threats to the grid. Yeah, we've got you know Chechens that are that are targeting you know our, our soft commanders you know, yeah. here on on a home wing. You know, it's another big story that just broke. So you know, if they're doing all that, then then they could attack infrastructure as well. These are just all all potential things. Understand that if there's a governmental apparatus, or even not even governmental, I could I can target DMR with common off the shelf equipment. Right. You know, I can I can target it. You know, I've got, you know, a spectrum analyzer here. Yeah. I can pull metadata off of it using SDR and a, a freeware program called yeah. SDR plus or uh, DSD plus rather, digital speech decoder plus what yeah. it stands for. And these are all free programs. Yeah. Which which in the next episode, in the second episode, we'll be hitting hard on SIGIN. And that's yeah. something that yep. I'd really like to dive into on that next episode because I think it's one of those things like once you get into the radio world, now that you're in it, it's like now you need to know what is going to get you killed, what is going to get you found, and all those types of things. So I think that the big thing is is at least on that first initial step is just like figuring out why is it important to communicate? What's, what is the importance of that? Exactly. And and so a lot of dudes get deep into the weeds on the comm second, yeah. and that's all they dial in on, and they fail to realize like, you know, there's a barrier to entry first on that because right. it's 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 expensive. Sure. Um, there's you know when when most people are more likely just to buy this and justify that. So now we be, we need to really focus on okay. How do we make this most effective? Mm. Like all right, this is the weapon you have. Maybe not the weapon you want. Yeah. But this is the weapon you have. How do you make this most effective? And believe it or not. We can turn this into a digital radio as well, all right? Not a digital mobile radio, not yeah. DMR, but we can actually turn this into a digital radio. And the way that we do that, so uh, got some tools here. That Perfect. We'll just take apart. Uh, the first thing is, and by the way, this is a Baofeng radio as well. I know it, you know, looks like a. a it's pretty cool. 152. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's that form factor. Yeah. That's not why I like these, by the way. Um, it is, you know, these are obviously in bitter sized, uh, Harris Falcon 3 sized, but they push out 10 watts, wow. which is really cool. The batteries on these are friggin' huge. They are uh, 1.2 amp hour batteries. So, like, the, the battery life on these are, are really long. There's rubber gaskets. Oh, so nice. It's rubber gasketed on the inside. They're not waterproof rated, but um, big class that I did last year in Wyoming, it dumped rain. Like Wyoming, that part of Wyoming, uh, Dubois, Wyoming, the Wind River Valley is yeah. always real dry in the summertime. And all of a sudden, they're getting like a biblical flood out wow. there. One of the Bubba's in class had some 152s and he left them out overnight like major minus yeah you left your equipment out you know like um and i was thinking when when uh, we got back out to the training site that morning i saw them laying out there i was like oh those are toast like there's just no way they fired right up they were wow that's and it was, it was like three inches of rain that night they're still working wow. I, I was blown away i was like dude there's no way it's a testament anymore. yeah and they work yeah but um, anyway, 152 puts out 10 watts. Um, I really like it because the screen's large, so I can see it like if I'm running this at night mm -hmm. under nods, I can still see the screen. Um, you know, like when we're running nods, depth perception is, <laughs> is a problem. I've got, you know, and, and when I'm in the field, I'm always wearing gloves. Yeah. So I can index the buttons and the controls. They're a lot larger because, you know, you, you see these little, little tiny buttons on here. You try and index these with gloves, you're going to fat finger that thing pretty bad. Yeah. It just ain't going to work. These significantly easier to run in the field. Um, but uh, I've got a, and, and again, these are like, these are right under $70. No, so, you know, still not a, a huge chunk of change on that. I've got a data cable here. 
All right, so this is, uh, these come from Baofeng Tech. I have them in the store. These are, uh, they call them the APRS cable. APRS is a, a ham radio thing where it's, you know, like a geolocation tracker and stuff. Um, but we're not using that mm. because we don't want to be putting that metadata out. Right. Right. But all this is, at the end of the day, you've got a microphone jack here and then the audio jack. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to grab a Wi-Fi only tablet. All right. So you can go to uh, Walmart and you know pick up one of the fifty dollar uh, onn tablets yeah like you know if you want to go up market you can get an asus or yeah. samsung or whatever but here's the deal folks make sure that it is a wi-fi only tablet mm. doesn't have a data plan there's a sim card in it because when you do that what you basically have is a big cell phone okay right. and what we're trying to do is mitigate that metadata right cell phones are always being tracked that's a whole other rabbit hole um, even when they're cut off, they're not really off. We can, you know, there's a number of ways we can exploit all that metadata, right? So what we're gonna do is we plug this in into the microphone jack, plug it in into the audio jack, and I have a freeware program. We want to cut the radio on. Perfect. I've got a freeware program. We'll get you set up here. Let's cut this on so that that uh, they can hear the yeah. audio output. So, <clears throat> you know, one of the issues that we would run into overseas, and I cover this in depth in class, is, you know, when you're sending traffic. Right. Um, usually there, there's a reason. You know, we're not we're not getting on there and just, you know, having a, a phone conversation. and Hey, bro, what's up? Like, no, we're not, we're not doing that. There, there's some sort of reason that we're sending that traffic mm. could be a spot report like a salute report the medevac request could be you know coordinating assets for moving around in, in you know unconventional area right yeah you know, any of those things well you know there's errors in transcription over right. the air because something that i emphasize in class and i've seen this many many times i know you have too is you don't know what you sound like on the other end yeah and you get that guy who's like super excited. He's in the middle of a tick, like our uh, troops in contact or like whatever's going on. And all of a sudden his, his, his like whole traffic handling ability just melts down yeah. into, you know, you know, and, and it turns into say again over, yeah. say again. Over, and, and you're just not, um, you're not getting a clear copy of everything. Mm -hmm. So if we can turn that into a tactical chat, right. Now you get a clear transcription of everything. Right. And there's no voice involved in it. So that's masking a lot of that metadata. So what we're doing is, is we're eliminating metadata from mm. the equation. So there's a freeware program for Android called and FL message, A-N-D. Uh, so Alpha, November Delta, Fox, Lima, yeah. Mike, Sierra, Golf, and FL message. 100% free, you can download this. I strongly recommend if you're setting up a tablet for this to sideload it, uh, meaning you you get the APK file, the Android programming kit file off of like GitHub. Uh, and FL message has a GitHub, so you can get it from there. You get a clean install and then install it from that laptop off the internet. That way you're never attaching, like this tablet will never go to the internet uh, okay. there's no like so like eventually let's say like again fictional scenario worlds went sideways and let's say i get rolled up like and it's mm -hmm. turning into seer school right? yeah um then i'm gonna get free manicures and dental care yeah <laughs> uh, uh you know and, and at the at the wonderful you know camp slappy yeah um they're gonna exploit whatever data is on this tablet like they're gonna rip all the data off of it. Whoever it is that rolled me up, they're gonna have a signet guy. They're, they're, you know, if they're worth their salt, they're, they're going to be doing that in some capacity or another because right. we did that. Yeah. And that's called sensitive site exploitation, right? Um, so we want to mask as much metadata on these devices as possible. And so with AndFL Message, it's a freeware program. This tablet never got on the internet. 
right? And so we'll just go on and open up the program here. And so now you have a tactical chat right here, right? So we've got a tactical chat on the screen. I can uh, open my terminal and type in my messages. I've got the mode that I'm going to be operating in right up here. So oh, there you go. Let's turn that up. that up. So now, so you just sent me a radio check. Let's see. I right, pulled it in. So if you want to just type something in, I'm um, telling so you all can see it. Hold this up to the microphone so yeah. you can hear the audio output. And so your message coming across. All right, so, you know, if I want to reach out pretty far and I don't want to have just inter rely on inner team or just use it for, you know, I'm in the front yard, can you talk, call me in the backyard? Like, I want to start talking <laughs> to my neighbors who are like, or my friends who are maybe a few miles away. Right. I know antennas have a big role to play, but how big, how important? Huge. Okay. So I love using analogies of the shooting world with radio because it's something that's very tangible for us it's very tangible uh for for new people you know when we talk about precision marksmanship the barrel makes all the difference right right so there's no way to make up for a trash barrel if if that one piece of the equation is not there then nothing else is is really going to matter well it's like that with antennas too. It, it doesn't matter like, all right, so we've been talking about the bow thing and like point of entry into communications and everything, all that's really cool. But if you don't focus on the antenna itself and pay attention to, you know, the math that goes into it because there is some math, unfortunately, because it's all physics, folks. Um, you're gonna have marginal results. And so like for inner team communications, for example, you know, a, a shortened antenna is actually optimal because you don't want your signal going out a ridiculous amount of distance. Because, if, like, we're on a patrol mm. and, you know, you're the alpha team leader, I'm the bravo team leader, and we're coordinating with one another for, you know, our fire and maneuver, uh, support by fire and the assault element and all that. So, actions on the objective, all that cool stuff, right? I don't want my signal going very far and we're not going to be that far apart right simply speaking yeah we're not going to be more than a thousand meters apart from one another or you know let's say half mile at most right right at most <clears throat> but getting more into like uh the survival perspective of hey i want to communicate maybe the next county over mm. for example now you really need to pay attention to optimizing the efficiency of that antenna. And there is some math that goes into it. Um, you know, building antennas is a big thing that we do in class. But I have step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that in the book as well, in the antenna chapter. Hmm. And um, right here, you know, we've got an improvised antenna uh, using a cobra head. So, you know, anybody... That or split post BNC adapter, and you know, in the army, we call those Cobra heads. But um, really easy way to make improvised antennas here, and then I've got electric fence wire uh, that's connected to it. And then, of course, the wood that you see here is just the the frame, the spreader for the legs. And I go into the math of, of all of this and, and why this is built. This is built for VHF mm -hmm. um, antenna. I think they cut this for for MERS one, which is uh, 151.82. But improvised materials here, you, you have like almost no money in this. Right. I got all these components from Tractor Supply and all the students in class build these antennas. I talk about that step by step in the book, how to do it. And with an antenna built like that, um, in the, the last class and every class that we do here, mm. we always test the equipment. And uh, something that I do is just like a leadership technique and um, uh, just interaction with the class is I'll just ask, you know, the students, like, who has the least confidence in their equipment? Mm. You know, because all of them build these antennas. Yeah. And uh, we work through it step by step. And, you know, who's got the least amount of confidence in it? And you know, they all always get a volunteer, you know. Uh, I don't think this thing that we MacGyvered together is, you know, going to work. 
We get it up on the air, and there is a amateur radio repeater that's 47 miles straight line distance from here. Wow. And we always hit that one. So does that mean that you're going to get 47 miles of coverage consistently and, you know, simplex, meaning no repeaters involved? No, you're not. There's some other elements there. However, let's say, like, you know, with my handheld radio, the antenna here, and, and communications coverage, that sustainment role that I was talking about is our, our task, right? right? I just want the maximum amount of range or with the maximum amount of coverage. How do I accomplish that? How do I get, you know, that reliability of, of distance, of overcoming the distance between all of us? Well, building an improvised antenna and covering that distance. And I always test it with, you know, a stock antenna. You can't make the trip, right? Then we put this one on the air and bam, all of a sudden we can get a significant amount of, of more coverage. You can do that as well. I mean, you know, DMR or anything that's up market from there, you can absolutely, it, it'll work with all that too. I mean, antennas are antennas, it's, it's physics. But, um, you know, with that said, the other nice thing about an improvised antenna. So this is going to give you, uh, we measure antenna efficiency in terms of standing wave ratio, and then also in terms of either gain or loss. Right. So when you put a, a short antenna on a, or suboptimal antenna on a radio, you're getting loss. When you have something that's more purpose built for the frequency you're on, you have gain. And this antenna design, which is uh, called a ground plane antenna or a jungle antenna uh, that I go into in the book. There's an interesting history from the interwar period between World War I and World War II about it, but or how it came to be. But um, that has 6 dB of gain. So 6 decibels. So like, you know, talking about suppressors, we've had right. like uh, colorful conversation behind the scenes of cans and you know all, all the things and the hearing say well the same applies to the signal strength coming off of your antenna mm. and we measure that in decibels as well six decibels of gain is giving me a lot it doesn't sound like a lot because six is not a big number but let's say like all right my my uh Baofeng ar-152 here in in an ambitter pouch um which you know this is my design pouch it's up on the store but this radio pushes 10 watts right so 3 db of gain or 3 decibels of gain is actually going to double the effective radiated power wow so 10 watts would become 20 well if i double that again it doubles on itself again because gain is logarithmic it's in orders of magnitude mm. and so now if i have 6 db of gain on this antenna 10 watts becomes 20 watts becomes 40 watts and that's at no no extra power there's no amplifier you're not you're not actually boosting the power output what you're boosting is the signal strength mm. because of the efficiency right. that's being put out so what does that also do for us because i'm, I'm big into the bang to buck ratio it also is going to increase our ability to receive signals. Mm. So let's say, um, you know, I'm here, you know, in, in my guerrilla camp, prepper camp, base of operate, whatever, you know, whatever fancy term you want to come up with, right? But we're here and I'm going to put one of these radio uh, antennas up and I've got one radio set to just monitoring things, right? Whatever. Uh, frequencies might be common traffic, you know, the uh, sheriff's department, emergency services, all that stuff, right? I'm going to be listening to all that for situational awareness. Well, I may not be able to receive all of that with the stock antenna, but if I put one of these up, because the higher up we go, the longer the line of sight we have. Right. The longer the line of sight we have, the, the more coverage we're going to have with our signal, right? That's why... You know, cell phone towers are as tall as they are, and we put them on buildings and, all, and, and, and what have you. Well, when we're, we're doing that, we're receiving so much better, too. Mm. And with 6 dB of gain, that's like 6 decibels louder of somebody speaking into your ear. Mm. That could be the difference between a mouse whispering in terms of signal strength 
or somebody shouting in your ear. Yeah. So you actually receive a lot of things. And here's here's something else that we do in class when I'm testing that concept and, and giving them a proof of concept in class. I tune it to the NOAA weather frequencies, which are um, in the 162 megahertz range, which you can listen to with your bow things. Um, your NOAA weather radio frequencies, you should keep tabs on, and I make a joke like it's Stephen Hawking that's, that's giving us a weather report. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. It's Microsoft Sam. It's yeah. that, that Stephen Hawking voice. Well, it, it there's seven channels that are in there, 162 megahertz range, and you're anywhere you go in the United States, you're going to be able to get at least one of them. Wow. And it's going to give you the light and weather data over, you know, from now to you know seven days from now and it's going to give it for a broad range of areas and you can use that data for obviously patrol planning purposes situational awareness uh, they push emergency announcements over that as well hmm. so um what i do with it as a proof of concept where we are located you know here in the foothills typically we're going to get three of those stations where we're situated here all right um, one from Blacksburg, Virginia, and then we're going to get a couple from here in, in North Carolina. Well, when we put this jungle antenna up, we get all seven of them. Wow. So all of the transmitters for this area. So you're getting everything, like literally from the mountains to the coast, you're getting it all. So when you're talking about uh, receiving capability and situational awareness and just all around, you know, let's say something that you really need to have as, as part of your communications plan, you know, paying attention to antennas becomes critically important. And so we were talking about, you know, what, what segued into this with, um, you know, we're on a patrol and inter-team communications, we're using little short antennas and, and that's all cool. And now how do we turn this like reverted into the sustainment role? that's how you do it mm. and again I've, I've got step-by-step -step instructions on how to do it in the book they're pretty easy to follow folks um you know if, if you got a pair of lineman's pliers and a spool of electric fence wire and a coax cable you can literally make this thing happen it, it's wow. it's not hard wow i've got some off these are off of amazon yeah stock antennas that you can just buy and I'd like to know your opinion, just because this is something that the general populace is obviously going to have the ability to Absolutely. just buy. Instead of, you know, you don't want to use a stock antenna that comes with a bayo thing. What is your, you know, just let me know, or what do you think about these different antennas? How are so, good are they? Is it worth getting? Tape whip. Yeah. yeah right, right off the bat. Um, this one, actually, the Nagoya 771 is, is excellent. You know, it's it's super duper flexible. Yeah. So like if you're trying to weave this into a chest rig, it's very robust. This is a really good one to have. Yeah. Um, I I'm a fan of these. I carry these in my store also, and you know they they work very well. This is also a really good upgrade. Usually, the first thing people do with a handheld radio is toss the antenna that comes with it because they're normally not that great. The 152's antenna is pretty good though yeah. that comes with it. But you know, this one, very flexible. I could weave this into a chest rig or something. Uh, and the, the shoulder straps works real well. Tape whip, uh, good old tape whip. You know, we're all familiar with these. Everybody that's, that's you know, ever- Looks cool. Hump the radio. <laughs> yeah, the, the tape whip. Um, this is literally a uh, tape measure on the inside and it's, that's where the attachment point is. Right uh -huh. there. And then they just sleeve it with, with uh, polymer over the top. Um, these perform really well, but with tape whips, I've broken a bunch of them. Oh, wow. You know, you, you always run into that, that dude in the field that, like, he's had his bent over the whole time, you know, and, and this is suboptimal, right? When you're bending an antenna on itself, it's not functioning. It, the best antenna is the one that's, that's you know, sticking straight up. Um, because it's electrically, you know, it completes the right. circuit. When you double it on itself, you're you're actually shorting it. Yeah. But uh, you're electrically shorting it. But uh, when when I bend it too many times, eventually it's going to have a point of failure in there. Yeah. And they're going to end up damn broken. And okay. I know you've seen that. Yeah. Um, anybody that's ever run tape whips have seen it. 
But in terms of performance, hey man, they do great. Hmm. Like they perform really well. They're awesome. Just know that that there is a point of failure with these, and uh, they can break on you. But um, other than that, you know, very good upgrade, worthwhile upgrade. Let's talk about our little stubby here. So we were talking about stubby antennas, and and this is you know this is a super stubby one. Very low profile for the inter-team communications. This is really what you want because, yeah. again, if I'm only trying to communicate over, you know, a few hundred meters, half mile at most, here you go. You you know, for comsec reasons, you'd probably want a short antenna so your RF isn't getting intercepted or detected. Um, and and that's regardless of like digital encryption or anything right. like this. But this is probably what you'd want. Here's another uh, benefit of having a stubby antenna like this one is you're probably not going to break this. Right. Like when, when I'm busting brush, I'm you know, doing movement to contact, we're on patrol. You know, we don't patrol in open areas. This ain't Ukraine. Yeah. And a whole lot of Ukrainians have got killed because they hang out in the open areas. Right. right. You know, that's SUT 101. Don't be hanging out in open areas. Um they got reasons that they are because they really don't have any kind yeah. of concealment. I mean, yeah, you know, Ukraine is like fighting in Nebraska. <laughs> a lot of farm. Yeah. yeah. All farmland out there. But um, it ain't like the hills or the pine jungle out here. Different, whole different animal. But when you're moving through vegetation, you know, you, you're going to get your antenna snagged mm -hmm. up on stuff. They're going to get broken, many such cases. Running a little stubby. That's going to benefit you a lot. Yeah. You know, and, and you're not likely to break this thing. So, you know, that's kind of a good use case scenario for that. So we've got our magnetic mount. Um, I actually run one of these, too, on one of my vehicles. I've, I've got a mag mount antenna uh, that I've had for a number of years. Uh, a car that I used to do a lot of commuting in. Yeah. With this, literally this exact same antenna. Um Magnetic mount antennas are really, really good. You've got your, your pigtail here um, where this this goes into the antenna port of the radio and then you have your, your connection for your, uh, your larger diameter coax here. How to implement a, a magnetic mount antenna. Um, these are specific for vehicles yeah. because you have the hot side of the antenna or the positive side of the antenna, which is you know, this is what's sticking up. And then the ground plane or the cold side, which is completing the, the circuit of the antenna, is actually your vehicle's body. Wow. And so what you want to do is, is take the magnetic mount and mount it in the center of the roof of your vehicle. Yeah. Or uh, if you've got a car with a trunk on it, you know, you're putting it right in the center of the trunk. That way you get a uniform radiating pattern off. Oh, okay. This is omnidirectional. Antennas fall into one of two categories. They're either omnidirectional, meaning they go equal in all directions, or they're directional, meaning they transmit and receive in, in one specific direction. Right. Or bidirectionality, I mean, two directions, right? But omnidirectional or directional. These are omnidirectional. And so when you, you place them in the center of a roof or the center of a, uh, the, the trunk of a car or yeah. whatever it is, they get a uniform radiating pattern off of the metal of your vehicle, if that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I just figured these are some I've seen before, so you have the expedience, and then also just some that are available on the market. Yep. Um, but just curious. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and. The nice thing is, really, you know, nowadays the availability of the equipment itself is inexpensive. Right. Like even in the you know the era of binomics and you know everything is inflating and you know it's, it just seems like everything is has additional costs added to it. Right. So like, the technology behind communications is actually still pretty inexpensive, and antennas themselves. Um, you know, I used to make a joke with like some of my ham radio buddies that were also into shooting and kind of my local uh, circle of friends. We used to say that uh, handheld radio HTs, say handy talkies, it's kind of a ham radio nickname for for handhelds. But HTs uh, antennas for them are like holsters. You're going to end up with boxes full of them. Wow! Like. You know, it, and it, I mean, it's like holsters, it's like chess rigs, yeah. it's like mags, it's like any other piece of equipment. 
you're going to buy tons of them. You'll run them for a little while. You figure the ins and outs. And, you know, some of them, what works for one guy might not work for somebody else. I'm over here talking about, you know, tape whips, how, you know, we broke a lot of them, and that was my experience. But they do work very well. I don't run them because mm -hmm. you can break them, but they do work really well. Yeah. So What are, okay, I guess my final question that I had for you was, what, what helps you make that decision to go, hey, I'm going to jump from this to now I'm going to get maybe like a man pack style radio? Like, what, what, would, what would be the reasoning for deciding to make that leap or to just go, hey, I'm going to learn this stuff. I might as well just go all inclusive, get a man pack, get a couple of handhelds. What would be so, part of that decision making process for you? Man pack radio, you're talking about an additional level of capability there. Yeah. Um, so, for example, uh, I have a uh, TBR 119 sitting over here, which is very similar to a Harris 117 um, with HF capability built into it as well. Right. You know, you're talking about a significantly higher amount of expense there. And so, what would be the use case for that? Well, additional capability, additional frequency coverage as well, but it's more when we talk about higher level of capability what we're we're specifically addressing is it's going to receive better because it has basically the 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 internals on the radio mm. are going to be more capable because they're larger right and they're the the, the whole um Basically, the power output is going to be better. The the ability to receive is going to be better. Your frequency coverage is wider. Right. It's a wider spread of space, and it could be uh, with throwing HF into the mix, which is a you know a whole other can of worms. We're talking about potentially global coverage in terms wow. of how we can talk. So with HF, for example. Um, on a very low amount of power using a digital mode you know any digital mode i could talk depending on the you know the atmospherics because it's beyond line of sight i could talk over very very long distances across the united states you know and, and internationally as well mm. and in class what we do with hf when we get into the hf block of instruction obviously build an hf antenna those get very large and we talk to areas in the region. So use case scenario for this. Um, let's say we're coordinating activities. For, yeah. You know, the, the resistance. Like for, for, for freedom. Afghanistan. For freedom. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Afghanistan, yeah. for example, National Resistance Front right. you know, in, in the Panjshir Valley. We would be in a situation like that. Like, let's just, you know, make it relevant for, for you know, all of our audience. Um they're communicating things at the the strategic level the mm. clandestine level they're communicating a lot of that stuff via hf because it's it's more difficult to direction find to get a line of bearing on it and it i can communicate over a really long distance mm. right so let's say like i'm located here in north carolina and i'm coordinating with you in florida or another group of guys, you know, on the Mississippi River right. or, you know, uh, people out in Wyoming or, you know, wh whatever. So I'm not going to be able to reach them with a balfour. Yeah. That ain't happening. Okay. When the, the grid is down or whatever, where I'm working in a, a clandestine nature. HF, however, I can. Mm. And there's a number of techniques behind that. I'm currently writing a book on those lines. But where you're talking about a, a man pack, uh, something like a TBR-119 or, uh, you know, a Yaesu uh, 857 or, or, you know, whatever their radios they, they have on the HF market. Uh, the 991, I think, is, is one or the uh, Zygu G90, which I've got one of these over here. Like where that fits into the mix is that long distance coverage and being able to communicate with people over a much longer range and where that would fit with a like a uw context is coordinating activities mm. you know maybe i need supplies like the stuff is being brought up from florida to help the war effort in north carolina 
but I need to coordinate with you to let you know what we need. Hey, what we're critically short on is Israeli dressings, tourniquets, and we need Clorox tabs for purifying water, mm. right? Because it's just, you know, things that you're going to run into in, yeah. in the environment. Um, so it's coordinating things along those to To include also being like, hey... I'm coming through. Don't shoot me. <laughs> you yeah, know, like, yeah, exactly. You know, kind like, of like hey, green hey, we're, blue, yeah. we're we're bringing up 50 fighters. Yeah. Um, our safe zone yeah. here. We're we're bringing them up along the the trafficking path mm. and, and bringing them in. Uh, a lot of examples of that. Would you Would you recommend for those man pack style radios, like just for the security of being able to reach back to your base camp or whatever? Oh, yeah. An individual running a man pack that's designated as an RTO, just yep. so that we have that security of. Ability. So, you're talking about at that point, it's it's a much higher level of training. Yeah. That's, that's required, yeah. and you know, it it the spin up time to train somebody to use a VHF UHF radio is pretty short. Right. I mean, you, you can do it in a couple of days. Throw in a bunch of exercises in there, and they're they're going to get really good at it in a hurry. Uh, with HF, the learning curve is significantly steeper. And, you know, that's a guy who, who needs to be more technically astute. Mm. You know, talking about, like, the military model behind things, not everybody's a trigger puller. Like, yeah. not everybody's cut out to be a trigger puller. You need your support guys. Your support guys are, are critically important, you know. And so whenever we would have combo problems, you take it to the, the combo shop. They get it squared away. They give it back to you because you're the end user. Well, you know... When you integrate those guys into a team aspect, maybe, you know, like, Kamo's just this dude's thing. Like, he's he's good at it, and then maybe you got another guy on the team that he's just not good at it. And like, he just doesn't get it. Man. Yeah. No matter what he does, he's just going to get, all right, cool. Well, don't task him with that. Yeah. You know, and, and so um, from a task organization aspect and a leadership aspect, you know, obviously you're using people to their abilities. But you come up with a training pipeline of doing that. And this is where ham radio comes in. Yeah. So ham radio in the VHF, UHF world, like that's the technician class. Um, you know, it, it, it's a point of entry. But all right, that, that's that's giving you VHF, UHF privileges in the am, amateur radio band. But in order to come up with a training pipeline on HF, you really need to have a ham radio license mm. in the general class or amateur extra amateur extra the size it goes but general class gets you on to ahf because okay maybe i have absolutely zero interest in talking to you know ham radio guys in like eight states away. okay cool you don't care about any of that right now mm. but that's a great training exercise for when i do need my equipment to work for other applications. Yeah. Because remember, at the beginning of the, of the episode, I said that ham radio is a hobby. Mm. What we're talking about here is practical application. Two different things. Yeah. Two total different things. It's it's just like, uh, you know, competitive shooting is a sport and is a hobby and is a heck of a lot of fun. And you're learning things that can be practically applied to fighting with a weapon. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The same is absolutely true of amateur radio, ham radio, in the HF context, because I am practicing with my equipment. I'm getting it on the air. I'm training with it. And hey, I might not have any interest in talking to that guy that's eight states away. Like it does nothing for me. Other than the fact that A, I know my equipment works. B, I know that I can talk to that guy that's eight states away. And see, over time, I've learned when that works, when I can do that, when I can accomplish those training goals. So now I have that working knowledge to say, okay, we're getting ready to go out into a, a UW environment. We're stepping off on a patrol where we're covering a, a long distance. And I need to be able to communicate back. Now I know how to best accomplish that goal. Yeah. Rather than relying on you know well this guy over here told me it ought to work yeah i have no working knowledge yeah i, I think and I, and I ain't gonna get it man. yeah i think I that's huge you said about even like on the gun the gun side just as an analogy 
having confidence in your equipment and knowing that it can work because you've done it yourself is so important. Mm -hmm. And for me, I almost foresee that like if you have your community of guys that you train with and stuff like that, you find that one dude who actually enjoys the ham radio portion and you're like, hey man, you're gonna be the radio maintenance guy. Like you're gonna help pre-program all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe you find a guy that is kind of interested and you make him the RTO. Right. So that way, anything that's programmed, you guys develop your own comexes your, or com, com exercises to, yep. to check your, your stuff and make sure that you're good. And then all of your handheld stuff now just becomes an individual responsibility as, as a requirement to be in the group. It's like, hey, it is your individual responsibility to know how to work a handheld. It is your individual responsibility to know the brevity, to know all the SIGINT stuff, which we're going to talk about in the next episode, like knowing all the security measures. And then you take the guys who are super passionate and be like, hey, man, like, yeah, you, you get the man packs and you're helping yeah, program yeah, all this. So here's the thing, you know, in the army, we had the common tasks. Yeah. Right. So you have your, your common tasks that like all soldiers are allegedly supposed to know. Allegedly. <laughs> Supposedly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll just leave that for what it is, uh, you know, because then we end up with, with you know, viral videos of uh, young female soldiers. Yeah. Marginal results. Yeah. <laughs> it is what it yeah. is, man. Hey, hey yeah, look, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm an Army alumni, bro. I'm yeah, gonna, like I'm Chris Gehens. Yeah, it looks yeah. like a bazooka. But, um, you know, it, it but... There's common taskings in the infantry world. There's common things that you're expected to know how to do. Yeah. Right. There's 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 a standard of performance that you you have to meet. Right. And that's something that um, I think a, a lot of people on the civilian side struggle with. Yeah. For a lot of reasons, and I don't mean that in a negative way at all. Like at all at all, because we all have our lives. Mm -hmm. We all have families you have obligations you have life just life throws you things but with your group as as a coming up with a training pipeline mm. as you pointed out one of the big parts of that is hey you know can you troubleshoot this radio in the field yeah like that that's a big one troubleshoot this radio okay can you set it up for digital operation right which is big yeah. very very big deal this is all common taskings and all of that again is covered in the book in step-by-step -step instructions that like anybody can follow, man. I was a knuckle dragon 11 Bravo. So I wrote it from that perspective of yeah. like knuckle dragon 11 Bravos. If they can follow his book, then the goal is accomplished. Mm. And anybody in the world is going to be able to follow it if they can follow it. Yeah. So um, coming up with those common taskings and that benchmark of performance, you know, nobody expects a group of guys on the civilian side to you know be a master of all the things right because you can't even do that in the military yeah like you, you i can't expect a guy um in any unit that i was in to be just a subject matter expert on all the doggone things now i've met a few people who think that they are but <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and I've got a few guys who, yeah. who really did yeah. like they just they're just freaks in nature just, they just they yeah. just strive for all that yeah. knowledge but um, you do need to have a base of knowledge. And so the double-edged sword there is like having, having a guy who does specialize in combat, yeah. but not being overly reliant on him and him alone. Because I've, I've seen this a lot of groups that, that have contacted me for training and we've run private classes and I've had them in the open enrollment classes where they're like, oh, well, Ted over here is our, our combat guy. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but Ted's on the other team, mm. and y'all are two terrain features away from one another, yeah. and you don't have comms. So. Yeah. Well, Ted normally fixes this for us. Yeah, but again, Ted ain't here, so what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, how do you fix that? Mm. So, well, yeah, I, it, it, everybody has to have that basic skill yeah. level competence. Yeah, I think that's the thing is, like you said, the basic skill level competence, if you want to be a part of that community, you have to give some effort into just, you know, maintaining basic responsibilities of what you should, the prepared individual, like you should know how to shoot, you should have accuracy, you should know basic SUT, you should know how to program your own handheld. And then you have that enabler that you des designate in the group to be the RTO, along with the master guy who is running, maybe if it is two different groups, 
they have one guy that runs that and the RTOs that go and they figure it, they learn under him. So right. I think though, like having that handheld capability and also, you know, a, a general understanding of being able to troubleshoot, troubleshoot makes you just more effective as a group, but it's also like basic responsibility if you want to be in a preparedness yeah. environment. So I mean, you have to have a benchmark of performance yeah. for physical performance, for marksmanship performance. And I'm not saying like, you know, you got to go out there and, and try to be dog on tier one pipe here. Like, no. But can can your guys engage target? Can they put rounds on steel at 300 meters? Yeah. You know, like in the scout course, we get them out to 400, mm. 450 if, if we've got the space. Here, you know, at my place on a range, we've got 450 meters. Yeah. Uh, but can they put rounds on steel that far? Okay. When it comes to combo, can you troubleshoot your radio if it's going to do what radios love to do when we have them on our kit? You know, dump their fill or, yeah. like, you know, it's just get off frequency or like whatever happened can you troubleshoot that can you do it under nods that's yeah. the big thing yeah can you do it under nods because everything changes under nods yeah. man. like all of a sudden like oh I have to... <laughs> you know we were having that conversation yeah. about you know the thing that you do in, in your carving course yeah. under nods and i think that's that's a really cool training technique yeah. Um, Which we'll definitely have to do a collaboration course sometime. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm like, yeah. hey, I'm, I'm pumped about that. Yeah, man. yeah. Because, uh, dude, you, you rattle people's cages yeah. like that. But then it's not something that's so hard that people just can't do it, that they right. shut down. But it does test people's metal a little bit. Sure. And, you know, hey, are you really serious about what you're doing? Mm. Because if you're really serious about what you're doing, and you can do it when you have the option to not do it whatever the training event is it's all voluntary yeah you know it's not like it is in the army where i used to remind guys you signed a contract to yeah. be here and you are here till your ets day you yeah know, like, um but it, it's it's not like that um with with a group of civilians it's completely different it's all voluntary it's, you know sui sponte yeah. of, of your own accord um, it, it, it's, they could leave at any time. They could check out at any time, like, you know, whatever, I'm out of here. So the way that you, you accomplish those goals is you rattle their cage just a little bit, get them outside their comfort zone. And if they're going to be doing all the things, whether it's marksmanship, whether it's combo, whether it's going on a ruck march, mm. you know, you know, going on a, on a fun run, whatever it is when they have the option of not doing it it's going to build that confidence and it builds an esprit de corps of like hey man i know that you have my back because you have demonstrated competence mm. in this skill yeah you know yeah and like it it builds i know that you could do it when it was moderately hard so when it really matters you're not gonna fold yeah you're not just gonna be like all right boys we're gonna wing it mm. like, Nah, man, and and that that builds confidence among groups. That builds an esprit de corps, a loyalty to one another, through that little bit of adversity. And it's it's just, there's so many intangible benefits to to that. So like we're talking about building a training pipeline and all that, going down that that rabbit hole with Kamo. You know, I know you know what you're doing. Mm. You've demonstrated competence on this. So you know, if if all of a sudden we lose comms between teams in the field. We can get that trouble shot rather quickly, you know, at night when it is when it's totally subpar, mm. you know, and the risk of blue on blue during a night movement is at its highest, you know. I know that you'll get it squared away. Yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. Well, I know that in the next episode we'll be talking about SIGIN. As a final word, could you tell give them a little taste or a sneak peek as to what the next episode will be and how important SIGIN is? So SIGIN, um, in a nutshell, anything that breaks squelch, anything that emits RF, we can intercept with relatively inexpensive equipment. Um, I have a tiny SA spectrum analyzer here. Anybody who's watched videos coming out of Ukraine recently, uh, the Ukrainian forces have been using this to uh, very strong effect for drone detection. 
Um, I can go in depth on, on how to set it up for that. But basically anything that breaks squelch, I can intercept with this and I get a visual output of it and I can uh, do an entire spectrum sweep of it. And I don't necessarily need to break your encryption or your comsec methods if I can simply intercept what you're transmitting. Mm. So if, if you're breaking squelch, I can find it. Anybody can using one of these and a few other tools. Um, you know, I've got another thing here we'll be talking about, AOR, uh, DB10. But um, relatively, in, in this case, relatively inexpensive, still inexpensive piece of equipment. These are uh, $210 on brushbeater.store, but we're gonna be going in depth in these, why these are really important, why you probably want one in your arsenal and what this can do for you at the small team tactical level for signals collection capability mm -hmm. and situational awareness on yeah. the ground. Yeah, I know the, uh, I know as far as like, if you're gonna get into radios, learning is of just how to operate is half the battle, but also understanding the risks and how to mitigate those risks of communication. And uh, honestly, risks that could cost you your life or compromise you or, or things of that nature. So mm -hmm. make sure you guys go check out Brush Beater and uh, pick up some radio equipment in the store. Make sure you get his book. Um, you can also find you on X. Yep. Right. So at Brush Beater. At Brush Beater. And uh, if uh, they have any questions, how can they reach you? So shoot me an email. Uh, I literally spend most of my morning <laughs> answering emails. He was answering some this uh, morning. Yeah. yeah it, it's in, and I try to get back to everybody as quick as I can. I do have a, a high volume of it. Um, Everything from night vision and thermal questions to communications questions. I am not going to uh, teach you classes via email. Uh, so if you're that person, please refrain. You're going to be disappointed. I will point you to the book. But if you do have technical questions, you can certainly get in touch with me. Uh, NCScout at brushbeater.org. More than happy to uh, help you out. Got classes up on the training calendar as well. So brushbeater.store slash training calendar and you will see uh, where you can enroll in the courses there as yeah. well. And I would also encourage you guys to support a local small business, veteran-owned small business, and we, we got to support each other more, and especially in this economy. It's easy to go to like a big giant corporate center like Amazon and get it, but it means so much more to, to be able to support that local small business, and also it's, it's all about helping each other out and, and the community. So make sure you guys go check him out. Um, guys, make sure you also uh, go follow us on Instagram for any behind the scenes type stuff, as well as uh, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, throw them below or get a hold of, of NC Scout. So well, guys, make sure you guys check out the next episode on SIGIN and the importance of that. Also continue to train, make sure that you are trained to be the asset, not the liability. And I'll hand it back to Eric in the studio. Hey guys, thanks for checking out another HatchCast episode. And if you got something out of that, a great way to help support the channel that's free is to share this video with a friend. If you got something out of it, a lot of our videos are more knowledge and to pass information based and to also encourage you. Um, and so if you did get something out of that and you think someone else would benefit, please share that along. I wanna leave you guys with um, this final thought. And I do get asked a lot of questions about prayer. And, you know, I think that sometimes prayer, you know, can be intimidating to people, but we have comms, we have radios, we have cell phones to be able to reach out to people for help or to just talk with them and talk with the ones that we love. And I wanted you to know that Jesus is literally standing right outside the door of your heart. Um, it's, I like to envision almost like there's a room and, you know, he, he's, you've invited, you invited Jesus to dinner and he's sitting at the table. He actually came early and he's just sitting there at the table all day, just waiting for you to talk to him, just waiting for you to pray to him and not pray to him to just give him glory and stuff like that, which we do. And just to, you know, when we have an appreciation for somebody that has done a lot for us, we always want to give them praise and how great of a friend they are. But Jesus is the one who is, has, has saved my life. Um, you know, when I've gone through hard things and he is that, he is the ultimate loving, caring God. And um, I like to envision that picture of him just sitting at the table 
waiting to just hang out and, and to talk to you. And, you know, there are so many times in my life where I've come and I've sat down at the table and he may have been waiting there for hours, you know, and I come and I sit down at the table and I give him, you know, two minutes and then I leave. And so I think that, you know, that has kind of, that picture has always helped me to kind of visualize that when we pray to God, He wants all of it. He wants a real conversation. He wants real prayer. And that's what real prayer is, is when you're just pouring out your heart to Him, you're telling Him about your problems, you're telling Him about the things that are burdening you, you're telling Him about the people that you're, you know, concerned about or that you care about and that are also hurting. And He's saying, I'm not shying away from hard conversation. I'm not shying away from hard prayers. And I just want real prayers. I want real conversation, and I want a real relationship. And God is always knocking on the door of your heart. Jesus is asking, let me have a relationship with you. Allow you, allow yourself to be able to let go of those burdens that you have in your life and to put it on Him. I've, I've dealt with that. I've, I've had huge burdens in my life. I've tried doing it on my own um, to, to a point where I've almost like just completely, you know, given up everything, uh, just trying to figure things out by myself, do it on my own, you know, take a knee and hydrate. And, um, and Jesus has been able to take that burden off of me. He's taken that burden off of Roy and Tyler, and he can take that burden off of you. All you have to do is just allow him to come in and he's sitting there waiting for you. He's sitting there waiting to have a conversation with you. He's sitting there wanting to have that relationship with you. And even for those who have a relationship with Jesus, He's waiting. Waiting all day just to be able to have a conversation with you. And so my question is this, will you give Him a real conversation back? If you truly do love Jesus, will you actually sit down and have a conversation with Him? Just like you do your spouse or your best friend or your mom or your family member. Are you, you, you give them real conversation because you love them and you care for them. And so are we reciprocating that with Jesus? And if you don't know who Jesus is and you would like to know, I'll tell you right now that Jesus has literally changed my life. He has literally taken everything that was hard and taking my, my pain and my brokenness and He was there with me in that brokenness. So if you're going through a hard time, if you're going through a struggle, if you're going through a time where I feel so alone in this struggle. I feel so alone in this chapter of my life. Understand that Jesus is right there with you. You may not know it, but He's there. He's there with you, and His heart is broken with you. He's dealing with those challenges with you, and He is asking, just give me those burdens. Let me take that from you. Like the Bible says, come and be yoked to me. My burden is light. And so I want to leave you guys with a passage that has really struck a huge um, connection point in my heart and has really helped me out, and I wanted to leave this with you guys. And it's Philippians chapter 4, and we'll start at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so guys, if you guys are going through a rough patch or you're having a hard time, give it to Jesus. If you have, you know, you're looking for prayer, comment it in this video. Send us an email at team at barrelandhatchet.com. If you're curious about who Jesus is and what it's all about, and how He can help heal your life, and how He can be there to walk you through the hard times, let us know. Send us an email, and we'll get a hold of you. And um, I just want to say thank you so much for, I really do mean it from the bottom of my heart, and Roy and Tyler, we also mean it from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much for supporting this channel, and um, we're so thankful that you guys are here. Anyways, thanks so much again. Guys, make sure you train to be the eternal asset, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.